New Testament readings from the Gospel of John. We'll be reading from verse 6 to verse uh, 28 of, or rather 34 of chapter 1. Hear then the word of the Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is God's holy and inspired word for us this morning. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And John becomes a major figure in this gospel. It's interesting that it's the gospel of John written by the apostle John, and yet the only John that makes it into the story, at least as a character, um, and is named is John the Baptist. John came as a witness. He came to bear witness about the light. He was not the light himself, we're told, but rather he pointed to another that was yet to come. And in doing so, John becomes for us an example of what it looks like to witness to Christ. He becomes an example in this gospel of what it looks like to point other people to the Son of God. This is of particular interest to us as we as a church are in many ways uh, seeking the Lord that he would help us to grow in evangelism this year. And with that as one of our 
focus is, it, it is fitting that we see what it looks like to witness here in the person of John. He won't be the last one. Uh, the whole Gospel of John is about this. John himself, the author of the Gospel, the apostle, um, he himself writes this in order to witness to Christ. But almost every character that you see that doesn't reject Christ becomes a witness to him, brings other people to him, or shares about him with others. And so we'll see it time and time again. John here testifies to those who ask about who he is, but he does so in order that he might ultimately testify about Christ. He points to Jesus, specifically that it is Jesus who is the Son of God. This all begins, really, um, after the the prologue in verses 1 through 18. This testimony of John begins when others first come to him, wondering why he's baptizing. Verse 19 says, and this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? It all begins with that question, who are you? Right? What, What are you doing? These are men who were sent from the Sanhedrin. And they ask him, what's going on? Why would they come to ask him? Well, they were likely sent to kind of suss out what exactly is happening. Because in Palestine at this time, and for some time before, and for some time after, there was uh, a lot of different people that would come, especially around the Jordan River, and begin claiming things like they were the Messiah, or they were an Elijah figure, or a prophet, that they were ushering in uh, a new messianic age. There were many who claimed those things for themselves. And it was the, the job of these religious leaders, in some ways, to go and find out, is it true? Is this really happening? They come and they speak to John. They want to know why he's performing baptisms. Why is he doing these things? Word has gotten out. John's ministry has had enough of an effect that more and more people are hearing about it. And so this commission from the Presbytery of Palestine comes to check things out. They ask him who he is. But they're not asking for general information. They're they're not just trying to find out, you know, well, what's your name? Why are you doing this? They they are specifically asking because they want to know, are you one of the ones that we're waiting for? Are you the one? Are Are you the Messiah that has come? Is that what you claim for yourself? John confessed, we're told. He freely confessed. It it's it's said many times. He it's it's as though he's very quick to say. No, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the one that was promised to come. That right there already sets John apart from so many that had come before him who had claimed that title. He right away says, it's not me. I'm not the Savior. I'm not the one who's come to set everything right. Well then, what? Is he Elijah? That's their next question. He says that he isn't. You need to understand that there was an expectation that Elijah, who if you remember, was taken up into heaven on a chariot of fire, that he himself, right, the the same person would return before the messianic age. This came from a lot of, of apocalyptic literature that was written in the intertestamental time. It was something that a lot of people thought was probably going to happen. You know, it's not so different than how many things do people believe now about what the end is going to look like, when it will happen, and and how it's going to happen. And you won't find what they say in Scripture, but if you piece things together, you see maybe how how they got there. The same thing was happening. They thought that Elijah would return. John says he isn't. Now, if you know your Bible well, if you know the Gospels well, uh, you know that Jesus says that he was Elijah. Jesus said he was Elijah, if you will receive it. What are we supposed to do with that? Right? How, 
John says he's not. Jesus says he was. Well, they're answering different questions. Okay, John, John was speaking to people that thought and were asking the question, are you the Elijah? Right? Are you, you this Elijah that we have in our minds that's going to be coming? He's saying, no, that's not me. Jesus will later say to his disciples, he was Elijah, but only if you're able to receive it. In, in the way that you're supposed to understand it, he was Elijah. He was an Elijah figure preparing the way for the true Messiah. He was the one sent ahead to point to one that would be greater than himself. And that's exactly what John did. The prophet that it speaks of, this was another similar type, end times, apocalyptic figure that so many thought, you know, in this kind of excitement that maybe we're, maybe it's the end, maybe the, the Messiah is coming to, to kick out the Romans and establish a, a completely new kingdom on earth. And there was that expectation, but it was all confused, it was all mixed up with their own ideas about what it would look like. And so they expected some kind of prophet. Well, if he's not Elijah, and he wasn't the prophet, if he's not one of these people that we thought that's, that's who would come first, but he is leading this revival in Israel, and he is baptizing people, well, then who is he? Verse 23. John answers, and he said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Isaiah, we read this text before in Isaiah 40. It's a, it, it, it's a, a new section in the book of Isaiah where, where salvation and redemption begins to, to be preached in a new way for the people that have been sent off into exile. The idea was that a highway, so to speak, would be made preparing the way for God to redeem his people, to bring them back out of the exile that they were in. And John says, that's what I am. I'm preparing the way for the redemption that's going to come. I'm preparing the way for this salvation. Just like Isaiah proclaimed, that's what I'm doing. I wonder what this commission thought of that answer. You know, they were under Roman rule, not so unlike the people in Isaiah's day being under the the rule of the Babylonians. They were waiting for one that would free them. But the exile that they needed to be freed from was of a different sort. So if John doesn't claim the authority of any of these end times figure, the next question they have is, then why are you baptizing? That's what they ask next. And it's ultimately a question of authority. They're asking, what, what kind of authority do you have to come here and baptize? Because John was baptizing others. Now, baptism was not you know, unheard of. It's not something new in the New Testament period. Baptism was common. It's, it's a ritual washing that was a common practice, except that at least in the, the early days in Palestine, or around this time, you know, if you go a few hundred years before and after, and even before that, but especially in this kind of anticipatory time when people think, you know, maybe, maybe the Messiah is almost here. Many of these kind of sects that would prepare for some kind of Messiah figure that would come and go and they would kind of ebb and flow. They would practice baptism, but it was usually self-baptism. Somebody would baptize themselves. They would pour water on themselves. They would, they would wash themselves. But John comes and he's the one doing the baptize. And so they're wondering, where does he get the authority to do such a thing if he's not Elijah, or the prophet, or the Messiah, then where does he get the authority? And even here, he still doesn't point to himself. And it would be so easy for him to do so, right, to take it to himself. So many others did, so many others have since, to build himself up, to make himself look good, right? This, 
this commission of these rulers of Israel came to him because of how successful he was, because of how many people were coming to him. It would have been easy for him to say that he was some kind of important figure, that that's where his authority came from. But that's not what he says. It wasn't about him, and he didn't come in his own authority. Verse 26, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not, I am unworthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, we're told, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. It'll go on to say that John was commissioned by God himself, that he was given this authority by God himself. But first, he doesn't even really answer their question, at least not directly. He points them to another. He doesn't talk about himself. He, he says, yeah, I've come baptizing with water, but what does he do? He uses that as an opportunity to point to one who is greater. One who he says he couldn't even untie the straps of the sandals of the one who is standing among you, he says. The untying of sandals, taking off of sandals, you just imagine it, right? If you wore sandals all the time, you're in a dusty, arid environment, I mean, your feet get gross. And the, the taking off of sandals, the untying of sandals, this was something that if somebody else was doing it for you, it would be the lowest of the servants, the lowest of the slaves. If you were an Israelite, you wouldn't even have another Israelite do this. Right? You would likely have some Gentile, right? somebody that wasn't even among your people. They would do it. It was whoever you thought of as the lowest. And John says, that's me when it comes to the one who's coming. He doesn't build himself up. He points to Christ. He baptizes with water, but there's one who's coming who's far greater, who's going to have a greater baptism. And we should take note, even as we are made witnesses of Christ, that even with great success from an earthly vantage point, when John is asked to speak for himself, he speaks of Jesus. He uses it as an opportunity to point to Christ. His whole life and ministry is about another. And this leads to John's pointing to Christ in the most direct way. He was preparing the way but the next day, we're told, he was able to point out Christ very directly. I can't help but notice that these religious leaders, unless they're there again the next day, they, they just miss Christ. They just missed him as he comes. And that's something that will happen time and time again. We're told on the next day, John sees Jesus. And he points other people to him. When you read the next day, uh, especially in the Gospel of John, when there's no accidental word in this Gospel. John is very intentional, and this is part of a sequence of days that's going to lead up to Jesus' first miracle when he reveals his glory for the first time at the wedding feast in Cana. So it's important to hold on to that. We're not going to get there today. I've got to be careful because I know many of you have already heard me talk about this and I could get off track really easily. But just keep that in your mind. But this is the next day. This is just after beginning this sequence of days. And, and John can testify about Christ. He can point to him because this one that he was speaking of, the one who he's not worthy to untie the sandals of, he is now here. And what does John say about him? Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's his first testimony about Christ and who Christ is, that he is the Lamb of God. Now, the Lamb of God 
was another term that in John's day was full of, of misunderstanding. We look back with the vantage point of the cross being on this side of, of redemptive history and maybe you have some of the right ideas about what it meant. But in John's day, there, there was a, again an anticipation that some kind of apocalyptic lamb of God would come and it would be, it would be this kind of warrior king. That's what the Messiah would be like. But what's interesting is that this is not what Jesus is going to be, at least not at first. That's at least not how it starts. Whether people recognized it at the time or not, John was saying something much more profound about the role of the Christ, that he, in fact, was the sacrificial lamb, that he had come to die. This one who... John is just built up, right? He's spoken of how great he is. He's come like a lamb to the slaughter. And he's come for the world, to die for the world. The word that John uses for lamb is not actually used that frequently. It's, it's not the normal word you would just use for sheep or something like that. It's actually only used four times in the whole New Testament, twice in this passage, twice in, in chapter 1, as Jesus is called the Lamb of God. And it's only used two other times within the New Testament, those pointing to uh, the Old Testament use of the word. In Acts 8, when uh, Philip is taken by the Lord into the wilderness... And he meets the Ethiopian eunuch. He shows up to testify about Christ. And the, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. Like a sheep, he was led to slaughter. Like a lamb, that's the word that John uses, before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. And Philip like another John the Baptist, can in the wilderness testify to who that Lamb of God was. He explains it. Likewise, Peter says in, in 1 Peter 1, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That's that's the only times this word is used in the whole New Testament. People thought they knew what the Messiah would be like. They thought they knew what the Christ would be like. But he came as a sacrificial lamb. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. He's the one that Isaiah prophesied about in Isaiah 53, who would make atonement for the sins of his people through death. I don't know that John understood that. I, I don't think he did. We'll see later on in John that there are times when John the Baptist, he didn't, he didn't seem to fully know what he was saying, and yet it was so true, more true than he realizes. He continues. He says he's the Lamb of God in verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Not only is he the Lamb of God in the sense of being a sacrifice, but he is greater. He is one who ranks above me, before me, John said. John was born before Jesus, but Jesus was before he was born. He was before John was born. He was before he was born. John testifies, maybe without even realizing it, to the eternal nature, that this is the light, the Word, the one who was from the beginning with God. Jesus is greater in every way, he says. Once again, he doesn't, he doesn't point to himself. He points to Christ. 
he shows how great Christ is. His ministry is, is always focused on Jesus. In fact, he says the reason he was sent baptizing at all was in order that the Christ might be revealed, in order that Jesus might be revealed to Israel. The whole purpose of his ministry was to show people Christ. Once again, we're told that John bears witness. Verse 32, and John bore witness. Again, he, he keeps bearing witness to who Jesus is. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus has come with a greater baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism was, was in a sense, negative in, in, in that he came to uh, call people to repentance. His baptism represented a, a, a kind of purification, a washing of oneself, but it wasn't, it didn't give anything. It was just trying to prepare people to, to, to flee from their sin, to, to put their sin aside. But Jesus, the one he bears witness to, has a greater baptism, a, a baptism that gives. He would baptize by pouring out the Holy Spirit of God. John testifies that when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God descended upon him and remained upon him, testifying to this fact. And John would never have known what that meant if he hadn't been told by God beforehand. His testimony didn't just begin with him. First, it was God, the Father, who bore witness to him. It was the Lord who spoke to him. It all began with God's word. When he was commissioned to baptize, we're told, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now the hardest part about preaching John for me is going to be trying to limit what we talk about. Because we're going to return to this. This is incredibly important for understanding all of, not just the Gospel of John, but understanding so much about who Christ is. But what John is told, that the purpose for John was that Jesus had received the Holy Spirit and he was going to give the Holy Spirit. Jesus will promise the same to his disciples just before his death in the upper room. The Spirit of God, which is necessary for new birth, for life, for light, for the true washing with the Spirit, for, for the true cleansing that all this baptism pointed toward for the application of all of God's work, for the opening up of eyes that one might see, that one might truly have the revelation of who Christ is. All of it comes from the Spirit, and it's Christ who John says will give that Spirit. This is what Jesus in part came to do. And all of John's testimony then leads to this final statement. Verse 34, his kind of final testimony about who Christ is, at least in this in this text. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John bears witness that Jesus is the Son of God, the very Word. Just as in the beginning God spoke and the, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, so here at the baptism of Christ, when God spoke and the Spirit descended upon him, John can then bear witness that this is the Son of God. This is him. It's the Spirit of God that manifests most clearly his glory. And John testifies to that fact. The one who was with God in the beginning, he has come. Now, like I said, John is meant to be 
a representative for you of what it looks like to witness to Christ. He is a witness just as you are called to be, to be a witness for the Lord, a, a representative for him. And before we close, we should at least talk a little bit more about that in an explicit fashion. I hope that as you're hearing this, you see that already. It's, I think in, in some way it might not be obvious, but we should be able to see in John what the role of a witness is. How do you bear witness about Jesus according to John? Well, first, we see that John had to receive the witness of God first. It had to speak with God himself speaking. God must speak if we are to know anything, and he has spoken. He's spoken in creation, but most clearly and explicitly, he has spoken directly to us in his word. And so you can't bear witness without his truth, but he's given you his truth. He has revealed to you who Christ is. You have to receive the word of God, which is the testimony of God himself, the scripture, as God is speaking from heaven, and that is how you first come to know Christ. And that's the second part, that the, the direction of scripture, God speaking, why does he do it? In order that Christ might be revealed to you that you might know Christ. Receiving the testimony of God means knowing who Jesus is. And making him known to others requires that you first know him. Right? John knew who Jesus was. He maybe didn't know everything. He maybe didn't even realize the, the fullness of what he testified to about Jesus. You might not always be able to explain everything even if, if you think you should know it, but you know something of Christ if you've come to know him, right? You know he is the Lamb of God. You know he has taken away your sin, right? You know that he is before you. He is greater than you, that he is worthy of worship and praise. Now, we will spend all of eternity growing in our knowledge of the glory of Christ, right? It's, it's not as though you have to know everything. Again, John maybe didn't even fully understand everything that he said, but he knew enough to be able to proclaim it, to testify, for it to be a true testimony about Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know who he is, right? The one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit, that gives spiritual life and power and comfort. You know that he is the eternal Son of God, the fullest of revelation of who God is to humanity. And so as you come to know him, and as you grow in your knowledge of him, what do you do with that? When the voice cries out in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord, when the Lord speaks, what's the response? The response is Zion going up on the mountain and declaring the good news. You then are called to point other people to him and not to yourself, just like John did. Like we said, John was impressive in many ways. He had an impressive following. And he says it was not for him. He could have claimed a title for himself. He could have claimed to be the Savior or the Messiah, like so many had before him, like so many would. Uh, but he didn't. And in refusing to take to himself the glory that only belonged to Christ, he was, he was pointing people away. And he was pointing people to the one who was the true life, who was the true Christ, who was the true Son of God. Just after this, John quite literally gives away his disciples. He, he literally just, you know, points them to Christ and they leave him and they go to Christ. And that was okay because it was never actually about him. And any kind of mission and ministry that we have on, a, on a, an individual level for you, just as a believer, 
and on a, a level corporately, right, as a church, as a body, it's very easy for us to want to start to take some of that glory. It's very easy for it to be tied up in our pride and our selfish ambition. And God, by his grace, works even through our sin. But the goal of personal evangelism, the goal of, of corporate evangelism as a church, the goal of our worship, the goal that we exist for, right? the goal of, of church planting as we've been engaged in that, the goal of all of it is, is ultimately to point others to Christ. It's not to build our own kingdom, our own followings, uh, but it's ultimately to point people to him. It's all about him, right? We, like John, are called to be witnesses, which means pointing to the one who truly is the Son of God. Let's pray. Christ Jesus, we do give you all the glory. We're grateful that you truly are the Lamb of God who's taken away our sins. We give you praise, Lord, and we pray that we, like John, would point others to you, that we would hear the words of the gospel, the words of God himself given to us, that we would know you more and more every day, and that as we know you, so we would make you known, so we would point others to you, that we would testify, that we would be a witness, all by the power of your Spirit, and in the name of Christ, our Lord, amen.